uh, go through the, the virtual home tour and make sure that makes help help us make sure that this is as valuable as possible to everybody that has taken the time to be here. Um, so what we're hoping to do tonight, uh, we're going to do a few things. We're we're going to start by uh, looking at the the virtual tour of the backyard home that we just that we're just finishing up in Florence, Massachusetts. Uh, it was a home we built um, for someone's son. Uh, to live right in their parents' backyard. Uh, and it's a really neat layout. Started as a, um, basically a custom design, custom design that ended up being part of our L-line design path after it was done, just as we were, we were very happy with how it came out. Um, <clears throat> so in addition to looking at that virtual tour, uh, we're also going to show you a little bit about, talk a little bit about how the design process worked. We'll show you the, the floor plans, what we did to um, what we did to to customize it. We'll show you some of the 3D tours that we use to give homeowners an idea of what it is that they are building, because um, it's it's quite interesting how close uh, they are to the real thing. Uh, technology has become a, a really long way when it comes to creating 3D renderings of space and helping you figure out if what you're about to build is, is actually what you want. So there's um, no regret <laughs> because it is, a, it is a big process going in and doing this. Um, Alexis, is there anything that you want to add about how to do questions and um, how to make sure people are heard? Yes. Um if you put things in chat, we will try to ask them, but the best way to get your voices heard is to throw it in the Q&A. Uh, that way I can check it off and it's just easier that way. Um, also, feel free to throw questions in there throughout the tour and throughout the entire webinar. We will have sections where we'll stop and answer questions devoted to that, uh, but throw them in there anytime. That way you don't forget or lose a thought. All right, let's dive right into it. So I am going to dive right in and share my screen so everyone can see the, the house itself. Okay. All right. So I think everyone can see the uh, my browser now with, um, with this shot of the kitchen. So we're gonna be using uh, Matterport. We, after we finish a house, we get 3D photography of it with a Matterport camera. Um, really neat technology. We'll be sending the link out to this when we're done, uh, but you can actually go through the house and uh, you can measure things. You can measure, which is, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, zoom in and, and really get as close as possible to the real thing without actually having to go in. And as we all know, in COVID times, um, the real thing can be, can be a hard thing to deal with. Hopefully we'll be past that by this summer. But for now, we're using uh, Matterport to kind of show you this. And we did do a, a, live, a, three, a live tour of this uh, three or four weeks ago uh, that is available on our YouTube page that you could take a peek at. Um, and there were lots of great questions that people could you know, we answered if we don't cover them tonight. So I think we're, we'll start right in here. So the first view that we're, that we're looking at here is a shared kitchen and living room. And actually, let me step back a couple, couple of spots here. So the house that we're looking at right now is a backyard home. It was built as an accessory dwelling unit. Um, in Florence, Mass, Massachusetts, which uses the zoning rules and jurisdiction of Northampton. Um, this house specifically is from our L-line design path, which basically just means that it's using an envelope that's in the shape of an L. Um, and we use that as a starting point uh, to customize the house to fit the needs of uh, the person that's gonna be living in here. And this house is two bedrooms, it's got two full bathrooms, and it's 850 square feet. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's quite a large backyard home. So looking through this space, um, right now you're looking at the front door, 
which opens up into this shared kitchen and living room space. This door right here is a nice big coat closet, um, place you can kick off shoes, place you can hang jackets, get them out of the main living space. And directly outside that door, uh, it's not in there yet, but there's going to be a big Goshen stone patio that with these three giant windows is going to really help make the interior space and the outside space merge. So it feels like um, a much bigger area <clears throat> and like you're outside when you're inside, which five, six months out of the year is a great thing to do. So again, this is if you just came in the front door, you'd come in on your left, have the coat closet, um, switches to turn the lights on, place to potentially put keys down, put your phone down. Living room area. Um, this on the walls, uh, a mini split that we're using to heat and cool the space. This house has three of those, uh, one in each bedroom and one in the main living area. So we can have so each room can have a different maintained temperature, which is also, which is important in this house given how it's going to be lived in. Um, this living room space is big enough for a full size couch. You have a nice big wall mounted TV and you can also get a, uh, an armchair in here. So you can have a nice cozy living room in here, living room space without it being, uh, without it being too small. So one of the things that you find when you're looking into small homes is often you can't get a full couch in there, in it. And if that's something that's important, it, it's something that has to be premeditated in terms of what furniture uh, do you want to try to include, include in the home. Moving this way, this is a back door. Um, we didn't do it in this house, but this back door, this area is designed that you could add a screen porch to really expand the living area or a, or a sunroom. Um, this door is something that is actually required for a separate form of egress. So when we're designing these homes, we do our best to not just throw a door in, in a, in a random space. We want to put it somewhere where it's actually going to have utility. Uh, to the to the actual living in, inside the house. And as I said, in this case, at the back door, it goes out to an area that could be a screen porch, or depending how this is laid out, it could provide access to a um, like a second backyard, private to just this home. Looking in, I just turned right, and now we're looking at. Uh, the kitchen, which is which is basically pushed into this uh, this corner here, and this is a this is a really nice big kitchen. Uh, there's two there's two areas of counter that can be used for two independent sets of food prep. Um, especially this in the corner here is plenty big to be to be prepping and getting it right over to the stove. Um, one of the things we we do try to do is put ceiling height cabinets in. Uh, it's mostly for aesthetics because a lot of people can't reach the top shelf anyway without a stool. Um, I'm reaching on my tippy toes trying to do it and I'm just about six feet tall. Uh, another, another design note here, you notice there's no window above the kitchen sink. Um, well, that's a decision that, that you have to make when, when designing a small home because you're choosing between extra storage, which is what we did here, and an extra window. Um, this kitchen doesn't really need the extra window. You've got the door here looking that way. As you can see, there's tons of light spilling in. Uh, this window is a southern facing window, so it's going to get good light at pretty much all points in the year. Um, so it was a good compromise to not have the window there, but also get extra storage. Um, you'll notice in this kitchen, we don't have a fixed island like we like we have in some, some of ours. Uh, for this, we remove that fixed island so a, a bigger table could be put here for actual uh, places to sit and eat. <clears throat> and this, can, this area here can essentially fit a, a full-size dining table. 
and this what this fan is could either be a fan or it could be a pendant like a uh, chandelier that would hang over that over a dining table these are regular size appliances that we put in here a 30 inch stove um, this is a 30 inch fridge so you don't have to make decisions to do smaller ones and i'll just kind of pan back around so you get your bearings of of where we are this is the living room space and looking down this way so to give you again we're at the front door here kitchen's on the left we are standing now roughly where a couch would go if we walk up this way we're going to go to um, a transitional area that gets you to both bedrooms the bathroom and a pantry in the laundry. So let's zip over there. So I just zoomed over towards this area. Um, this door here is a great big pantry, uh, floor to ceiling shelving, uh, which is something that's probably gonna be used as overflow if you do a lot of cooking, if you have a lot of, if you like to store canned goods, it can be used for cleaning products. It's just a nice big extra space to use for whatever you might need. Um, <clears throat> steering right, we'll move forward a little bit. We've got a laundry closet here, which if you do a stacked washer and dryer, leaves a ton of space on one side of it for more shelves and, and more ability to store. You could use it as a linen closet. Looking this way goes into the, uh, the bigger of the two bedrooms. And then pivoting this way, um, that's me as a ghost in the Matterport. Um, this is one of the two bathrooms. Um, we've got a, a corner shower in there, which we can zoom forward and look. And then this bathroom is dedicated to um, one of the two bedrooms and for, for guests that might come over. Let's spin back around. And I'll look back this way and, and show you the view where we just came from. So this is where we just were. And this is uh, 850 square feet, two bedrooms and two baths, which, which is something that's allowed in a lot of areas that allow accessory dwelling units or as we like to call them backyard homes. So let's go into, let's go into this bedroom. Uh, so as we approach this bedroom, this, let's actually jump right in here. Do a quick look around. So this is a pretty, this is a pretty large bedroom for a small home. Uh, and one of the reasons why we put such a big bedroom in here is the, the, the young man who's gonna be living in here spends a lot of time in his room. Um, and this is designed for two roommates to live in together, but independently. Uh, so we, we did both bedrooms so that they could accommodate someone being in them for, for longer than just sleeping. Um, this wall here is big enough to uh, do a queen size bed and the outlets are spaced for that purpose so they could land roughly where uh, the edge of a headboard would be and where you might have nightstands. And you kind of see those two little marks we, we like to put in um, outlets that have uh, USB ports in them. So you can plug your phone in because that's <laughs> everything is a USB charger now. Um, up above the headboard is another one of the mini split heads, which allows this room to have a separate climate than the rest of the house. And then we also, another thing we did in here, because we have this space and we're only anticipating one person living in here, is we did one four foot closet and then a four foot nook to put a desk or a window seat which would make this bedroom more usable for things other than just sleeping and then we've got this angled wall here um, to just make the flow walking into the room a little bit nicer so you're not hitting an, uh, an abrupt an abrupt wall when you walk right in it doesn't look like it would be an issue right now but when you put a bed in there it's going to help um, make the space work a little bit better. You see, that's the door that we just came into. That's the remote and temperature control for the 
the mini split. We've got this nice big window looking back up at the main house. Um, and then out here is going to be the, uh, that ocean stone patio I mentioned. So as I said, we've got two bathrooms. We've got two small bathrooms in this house, um, both of which have a corner shower, um, space for hanging towels right outside of it. A 24 inch vanity with a medicine cabinet for storage. And then of course we were able to get a window in here as well to let in some natural light. And then we did include a pocket door in here uh, because we, we, we like to use pocket doors when um, we expect that the door is going to be open most of the time. And as this is a bathroom for a single person, uh, we, we think it will be. And by having that door open, it's going to allow just more connectivity of, of light flowing between the rooms through the windows. All right, I'm just kind of driving back out here. Oh, there's another ghost. <laughs> the Matterport cameras tell you that you shouldn't, you should hide from it when it's taking photos because it does create ghosts like that. Now he's gone. Um, so this is the this is the second bedroom. Again, this is a pretty good sized bedroom. Um, it's a, not quite as wide as the other one, but from here to here, we're nine feet which gives us room for a queen size bed on this wall and about two feet at the end of it. So someone can come around, this bed can be spaced. So you've got room on either side of it and you can get around it. Um, but often what we're seeing in when people are using our L-line design path, um, this second room is not really used for a bed. I mean, maybe someone's putting a, a Murphy bed on the wall, uh, but for the most part, this is a flex space for guests to come. Uh, grandkids to come um, or just to be used as an office. But again, this is for two roommates. So again, in this room, we designed it. So there's a nice big four foot closet, a nook here uh, to put a desk. And when you're sitting in the chair at that desk, you're gonna be able to pivot your head and, and get the view out of these windows which is kind of a neat view because we're in we're in downtown Florence and we've got um, kind of a, a woods view. Um, this is this is a, an old mill building that's out behind this house. But when this is filled in, uh, there's a lot of green and it's quite it's quite nice and private. And again, we've got another mini split head in here, um, so this room can have a different temperature than the rest of the house. Anyone wondering what this is? This is the electrical panel. Uh, these are not on full basement, so they, they, we're putting the electrical panel somewhere in the house and we put a, um, a nice cabinet door over it so it's not a, an ugly eyesore. Um, so this is uh, a bat, the second bathroom and this is the bigger of the two bathrooms. We still have a small uh, corner shower in here. Um, but we did that so in, a, in an attempt to make this bathroom visitable by somebody in the wheelchair. Um, and, and what we're not process in working with the, the homeowner and uh, was somebody could potentially reverse into this bathroom, um, back up against where we have this rail, use the bathroom, close the door, and then leave. Uh, and, and with visitable, there isn't a lot of really well-defined guidelines for what that means. Um, so what we did in this case was kind of do our best to um, not use too much space in this bathroom, but still make it something where somebody could come over and because the, the person who's gonna be living here does have friends who, who are in a wheelchair. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing how that, how that works. Uh, so I guess with that, um, Alexis, any, has there been any questions that have come through before we keep plowing on? Yeah, we have four. Okay. All right. Let's answer some questions. That was a quick high level view. We'll answer some questions and then I'll show some pictures of the outside. What is the approximate cost of a build like this? 
So good question. So our outline design path, um, generally we're 780 uh, to 900 square feet is ranging from 180 to 200,000 in someone's backyard. So we're, we're right in that range. And that's with, um, and usually what we're, and usually with that, we're getting quartz countertops in. Um, these are not quartz countertops. This is a, uh, this is a laminate countertop, but that was a specific request by the homeowner to do that. Um, but we are trying to get things in that price range, like the crown molding, nice trim work, nice floors, um, the heightened cabinets. Well, that leads right into the next question. What is the flooring? <laughs> Good. Um, so the, this is, so the flooring is um, a luxury vinyl plank flooring. Um, and this is the standard option that we use in our builds. And it's uh, from a company called Shaw. And this specific line is called Endura Plus. Um, and we think, we think it's a, a, a great flooring. Uh, it does qualify on low VOCs, um, according to the, the, the Shaw group who's making it. It, it, looks, it looks fantastic. And for the, the cost, um, the cost of this flooring is of around five dollars installed, five dollars per square foot installed. Uh, so relative to hardwood, which is generally uh, more than twice that, uh, the value for money is is there. And and this flooring is essentially indestructible. Uh, once you put it in, as I say, vinyl is final. This this is certainly going to be a final flooring until you get sick of it. And this specific color is called uh, Rainforest Akai. What is the cost, the cost differential between full size versus smaller appliances? Great question. So smaller appliances cost more money. Um, and it's small appliances are usually 30% more expensive than their uh, larger counterparts. So good example is a dishwasher. So with a 24 inch dishwasher, you could find one of those for less than $500 for a baseline dishwasher. You could probably even get it for $400. Same with a fridge, like you can find a 30 inch fridge for four or 500 bucks, just a baseline cheap fridge. Uh, when you drop down into small appliances, they don't make them in the, in the lower specs. So the cheapest, 20, the cheapest 18 inch dishwasher that you can buy is closer to $750 and they go up from there. If you wanna do a 24 inch fridge, you probably can't find one for less than a thousand. Um, the only exception to this is 24 inch stoves. Um, you can find 24 inch stoves that are similarly in price to a, to a 30 inch stove. But they, it makes a difference. If you don't want the space to cook, um, by downsizing all of the appliances, you're saving almost two feet of space, which is, which is enormous when you're planning a small kitchen. Our next question, how does the mini split work when the temperature is below 20? Ours uses a lot of electricity when very cold. Below 20. Um, so the mini splits we're using, uh, the cutoff is negative 14 or maybe even negative 18. I think if we're talking about 20, that, that may be an older, an older unit that um, was designed to be mostly for, for cooling. Um, but the mini splits that we're using are designed to drop down to significantly lower temperatures and stay efficient uh, down into the negative territory. Um, when it does get that cold, um, the efficiency does go down. Uh, but the heating and cooling of the space with the mini splits is forecast to only cost three to four hundred dollars per year. Uh, so it's very it's actually a it's only a third of the of the energy use of these houses, which is incredible. And that stems from um, the small square footage, uh, the level of insulation that we're putting in these and just the how good the mini splits have gotten. Uh, the cost the, the cost to run these actually comes from running the appliances, the lights, and the, and the domestic hot water, so taking showers. 
Uh, it's a, it's kind of a weird thing because when you're thinking about a regular house, the primary driver of keeping it on is typically the heat. But it's not the case in these small houses with the mini splits. It's really neat. Thank you to, to the new technology that's out there. All right, our next question. Would a vis visitable bathroom include a bathroom that one could roll up to the sink? That one pictured seems to be a bit difficult to wash hands in a way. Yeah, and this is, and I, I don't want to overstate in finding visible spaces. Um, it is not our expertise. We were working with the homeowner and going back and forth between pros and like all of the trade-offs that come with, with trying to do that. And this would this would not be easy to wash your hands. Um, it, it certainly wouldn't. Um, but you could do, you could do, you, if you wanted to in your space, do something more visible, you could do something that did have an overhang so someone could pull right in there underneath. Um, so that's a, that's a very good point about the, the visible aspect. But again, I don't want to overstate our competence. If you wanted to work with us to design a truly visible space, um, I would want to bring somebody into a, in a wheelchair to, to comment on it and then let us know if what we're doing actually makes sense for them. Can you add a bathtub instead of a Absolutely. shower? Absolutely. Um, and we, we often we get requests for soaker tubs um, so you can you can certainly do a bathtub, um, and in this space, a bathtub would actually fit. Across. So instead of this shower and this sink, you could do a bathtub against that back wall, and then you would you would have the sink, the sink and the sink and toilet essentially goes there. So this bathroom is convertible to being a tub rather than than this corner shower. And then you could also get a window in it as well, which is nice. Our next question is a short series of questions. Um, asking about the width of the front door. Is it able to get a couch in? Is there any particle over the front door? Is the microwave uh, vented? And width of the- That's a good question. So this is a 36 inch front door. You can get a couch in through it. We've, we've brought full size couches in. Width of the back door, uh, this one is 30 inches. So just so big enough, you can actually drop this down to 28 inches, but it becomes a custom door at that point. Um, and we didn't need the two inches in planning this. Uh, you could also do a slider here and drop this window, which is kind of nice. And, that, and if you're doing, if you've got a nice backyard space, that would be a, a good option. Microwave is vented directly outside, which is very important in small homes. Uh, it does it does reduce your um, air exchange numbers. So one of the things that is being looked at when you're doing energy efficiency is how many air exchanges per hour, basically how leaky is your home, and, and having an exterior vented microwave is going to impact that. But um, from what we've seen in our research and our comparisons the value add of having something that can pull bacon smell or fried chicken smell or burnt toast, whatever the heck it might be out of your house. So it doesn't end up in your bedrooms and making everything stink. It's worth, it's worth the, uh, the slightly leakier house. Uh, so door, door, microwave, did I miss a fourth one? Nope, that was everything. Right. Um, the next question, is what is the smallest floor plan in your repertoire and associated cost? Um, so the smallest one that we've designed to date that we're, that we're happy with is 450 square feet. It's a 450 square foot uh, one bedroom that acts as a backyard home. Um, we are working on a project right now that is going to be a guest suite and backyard office, which is smaller. Um, and I, we haven't actually nailed down exactly how big it's going to be, but I think that one's going to be under 400 square feet. Uh, so it kind of depends what your what your use is. Um, one of the one of the things with with designing small homes is you to some degree hit a floor on the cost of the house. So there's a lot of things that go into building these that um, they just don't get cheaper. So uh, digging a foundation hole, for example, um, the, the foundation hole for a 400 square foot house 
and a 700 square foot house is basically the same amount. The cost to hook electric up to a 400 square foot house and a 700 square foot house is also the same amount. So to answer your question, um, a 450 square foot house um, pre-COVID, we were really excited about being able to do it for under $120,000, um, including everything ready to move in, foundation, electrical. Now we're 125 to 135,000, depending on um, what the specs are inside. Uh, if we if we go as far as taking out a, a lot of the niceties in here, we we can squeeze the price. But again, when we're getting into those small square feet, upgrading things like the flooring, upgrading trim, um, it it doesn't have as big of an impact as it would in a bigger house where there's more of it. Um, Alexis, one second. I gotta grab my power cord. My my battery is about to die. I'll be right back. All right. All right, I'm plugged into the wall now. We're good. All right. Um, does the unit have a separate electrical service? Um, so this one, so this one does not, but we do aim to do submeters on these. So we do look, we we do usually try to do a separate um, sub submeter, which allows you to uh, have a separate electric bill. Uh, same goes for cable. Um, it does not happen with water and sewer or for gas, although we hook these up to gas, they're all electric. And actually, Northampton um, is rolling out all kinds of neat new zoning rules uh, that significantly, that's not the correct word, that, that basically pr push people to not do natural gas or fossil fuel hookups. They want it all, everything to be all electric with many splits, which is really neat. So. Uh, electric can be separate. Um, internet cable can be separate. Water is going to be combined. Gas is going to be combined. Where is the water heater? Where is the water heater? Good question. I don't think I've got a photo of it in here. Although maybe I do. The water heater is behind that door in the closet. Um, and before you think that we stuck a big, ugly water heater, um, let, me, let me rephrase it. So there are two options for water heaters. Um, one is an instant hot water heater, which would be behind this door, um, recessed into the wall. It's about four inches deep and 18 inches tall. Um, in this house, there's actually a water heater uh, in the crawl space, which is down below this trap door. This house has a 36 gallon low boy water heater. And the decision about which water heater to use is uh, they, they use basically the same amount of energy. Uh, there, there's some argument that can be made um, that one is better than the other from an energy use standpoint, depending on how many people are living in the house, how often do they drain a 36 gallon water tank, um things like that but our decision point about which heater to use is based on how much energy we can get to the house so an instant hot water heater uses an enormous amount of electricity when it's heating water it can draw up to 80 amps and typically we're only sending 100 amps uh, to these small houses uh, which means when a instant hot water heater comes on in a house like this that doesn't have enough juice it makes the lights flicker um, in order to be able to do that and, and not have those electrical issues, we have to basically do a 200 amp service, which most, most houses just can't accommodate. And the cost in order to do that is usually prohibitive. Um, and it's extra, it's like an extra four or $5,000 to get the, to get the extra power needed. Um, so we usually try to make space to, to, to put in a, a low boy water heater 
versus upgrading for the instant. Our next question, what roughly is the current effect on property tax slash community costs? Um, good question. So the effect on property tax is different depending on where you are because towns are assessing these differently uh, depending on, they, they, they have different methodologies for how they're appraising the value of these. In Northampton, they see this as basically a second house on the property and they're appraising it as a second house. So the property tax increase uh, is probably going to be relatively, might be higher than you expect. Um, in other towns, however, they appraise them as a second unit. So the incremental increase in taxes is, in, is gonna be lower. And then the third way that we've seen it done is these are assessed as just additional square footage like a typical in-law suite. And that's gonna have the lowest impact. Um, you'll have the least, the, the lowest assessment value per square foot of the three methods. Um, impact on community resources. I, as I think about that, it seems like there's a lot of different things that that question could be asking. Uh, I'll try to run through what, what I would expect the situation to be. Um, most of these are housing aging parents, people with disabilities, uh, younger renters without kids. So I don't think they're going to have an impact on schools. Um, they're going to increase the tax base. So that's a good thing. They're not going to have a significant impact on water sewer resources because they're connecting into existing sewer lines. And generally, when you're thinking about adding one unit, uh, it, it's not going to have a, a, a huge impact on a sewer system that's designed for tens of thousands of units. Um, and when we see towns uh, have create new accessory dwelling unit rules, we don't see enormous increases in housing units. We see slow organic growth. So dozens of units, not hundreds, not thousands. So I don't think the impact on community resources is gonna be very high. Uh, given they could bring people into town, it could maybe more people are gonna use the trails, but, but I, I, we don't think they're gonna have a big impact on resources. And if they do, it's gonna also increase the tax base. So um, the city will have at least some additional resources in order to address the higher impact on community resources. All right. Um, is there an outside portico over the front door to protect from rain? Um, so there is not on this one, but that is something that we can do. Uh, we it can be guttered to keep rain off of the door and creating ice underneath it. Um, it could have a full portico. That's um, generally a, a nice looking portico. Uh, is probably going to at current lumber prices is probably about a four thousand dollar addition to some to one of these. Um, so overall scheme of things, it's not huge, uh, but if you're trying to hit a budget, uh, that might be something that, that gets dropped off. Um, if there's not a full basement, is there enough of a basement so that dampness and mold is not an issue? Um, so the, the size of the basement isn't necessarily going to be the, the primary driver of, of mold issues. Um, in fact, a smaller basement is going to be better because there's going to be less stagnant air and it's going to be closer to being conditioned by the, the space above it. Um, the key is making sure that the basement is watertight, that has a good strong vapor barrier, and that you're not getting huge temperature fluctuations down there. Uh, which would potentially create vapor and, and cause air to go down there or moist air to go down there and condensate. The neat thing about using, about heating houses, heating and cooling houses with mini splits is these are basically air conditioners and air conditioners are essentially pulling moisture out of the air. And, and these have an outside drip that is basically putting water outside the house. So these have a drying effect. 
for the house and for the crawl space underneath. Um, so we're, we're not, we're, I mean, we're always worried about uh, mold and moisture issues in a basement, but in these houses, it's very unlikely to be an issue unless there is a failure of the moisture barrier or waterproofing system on the exterior of the foundation. Um, one of the foundation systems we use is called a frost protected shallow foundation wall, which is the least expensive foundation with the exception of helical piers that we've come across. And the, it has an 18 inch space underneath the floor. It's kind of like a hybrid slab. And that space actually becomes part of the condition space. So it's constantly being heated and cooled and uh, dehumidified when the heating and the AC is on. All right. And our last question as of right now, um, if the small home is very far away from the main house, does that increase the cost? So the house would need new electric and water and sewage. Um, so distance from the main home doesn't generally um, impact whether or not you can use the existing water and sewer lines. Uh, when you go further, you just need to increase the diameter of the water pipe size so you don't have a pressure drop. And um, the sewer, you can always install a septic pump. And that does have some distance restrictions, but there's always a bigger pump. So there are some, so costs definitely go up the further away from the house that you are. In the cheapest, the cheapest way to do utilities is to have a wall attached and just drop them right into the basement. Um, but it's not, it's not going to create, it's unlikely to create a situation where you would just would need to create a new septic system or uh, have to get a new service to the street. Uh, given I want to put a caveat on that because there are situations where we may decide to do that, but it would be for reasons beyond just cost. All right. Yep, as of right now, we have no new questions. If you'd like to move on to the next section. Yeah, so let me, so I think what I'll do, so this may have been helpful um, earlier on, but this is the, uh, this is the floor plan for this house. And um, we're the program that we use for doing our design work is called Home Designer Pro. And we're able to make changes in this very, very easily. We can model furniture. Um, we, we typically, when we're working with a client, do design in real time. So if someone's looking at this with us on a Zoom call and says, hey, I don't want that window there because I want a 70 inch TV. We say, fine, let's go ahead and do that. And let's, uh, okay. let's give you, yep. You're not sharing. I'm not sharing. Good. Thank you for saying that. I always do that. Um, so sorry now. So I'll start over. So this is the floor plan for the home we just looked at and we use home designer pro, which is a, um, it's a program that we use because we like how easy it is to work with a client to make changes in real time. And the example I was just talking about was if we're looking in this living room area and someone tells us that they've got a 70 inch TV, not a 40, not a small TV. Well, we can say, sure, that's great big you really can't fit it there anymore we're, we're going to be able to go in and make these kinds of changes in real time which which i think from what we've seen is a little bit different um usually there's a lot of iteration done behind the scenes but we really like to do a lot when people's eyes are on it because when you're building a small home we're we're, we're doing design work to match how the home's going to be used so we're asking questions like how big of a TV are you going to have? Is, do you just have a 40 inch TV? Do you put it on the wall? Um, and we make sure that there's enough room for it. Like there's no rule to how big of a space uh, you need for a TV. It depends on how big your TV is. Um, same goes with, with kitchen. We, we can work to, to, to make the kitchen bigger or small, switching these door, this door around. And the neatest thing about this is how good, the, how good rendering has got. 
So this might look familiar. Um, this is the kitchen we were just touring. Um, and it, it's very, very similar. Uh, the, uh, the textures and the colors are not great, um, but a program like this allows us to really be confident in the flow and uh, the spatial awareness that that's like when you're when you're trying to make sure that you're going to have enough space around the sink when you're going to have enough space coming in the door can you fit a table in here those are the kinds of questions that we're we're asking uh, when we're using this program and then depending on how detailed somebody wants to get in terms of uh, design like specific cabinets or specific flooring um, we have another, I'm, I'm going to bring up another screen here in a moment. I, um, we have another, we can do some photorealistic renderings and achieve a much higher level of, um, of, of quality in the rendering. So let me bring one of these up. Sorry. Chris, we can only see the- Yeah, um, I'm switching it right now. Stop share. I'm gonna share my whole desktop this time. So you can see with this kind of imagery, um, we can achieve a much higher level of, um, of realistic, of authenticity with this. So you can really get a sense of if you're gonna like that. Uh, we've done, um, we did a lot of this with the one and a half story house that we built, uh, which was experimental. And we really need to get a sense of what an upstairs half story was gonna look like. So we did these renderings with our designer uh, to really make sure that we were going to get what we expected uh, when we went to build this as an experimental house. So we've got a couple different ways that we go about it. Again, Home Designer Pro allows us to design in real time and nail down space. And then those photorealistic renderings give us the opportunity to um, focus on design if that's something that uh, that's that's needed, depending on what what we're trying to do and, and what, what what look we're trying to achieve. So I guess we'll end here with just uh, with some photos of this happening. So this is the uh, the backyard digging the foundation hall. Um, again, before there was snow, this this project unfortunately had a uh, COVID related delay that pushed us back a month. We we hate when that happens because we do try to do these on a very tight schedule, basically starting digging and having move in occurring six to eight weeks later, that did not happen with this project. Um, so I know there were questions about the foundation. Um, this is our foundation wall in here. Uh, this is uh, insulated concrete forms, which allow us to have a, a really great R value going all the way down and bringing this into our building envelope. This does not have our vapor barrier in it yet. We do that um, a lot closer to when the house actually comes because once you put a vapor barrier in there, if it rains, it, it holds the water. That's the house. Us in the Elks parking lot in Florence. Uh, use the, if, if, if you've got a house that you're building near Northampton, uh, there's a good chance we're gonna use the Elks lot as a staging site. Um, that's coming in the backyard. Uh, this project probably had the, um, it was the tightest squeeze we've had so far trying to get in a house. And this is really one of the biggest, one of the biggest trailer loads we can, we can bring down the highway and, uh, and back into a house. And this is coming up from the Elks coming into downtown Florence. And Harold's helps us with last mile shipping and crane service, which has been, been a great help. Uh, and there's a video of this on our Facebook page too. So we've got the crane back there. The crane goes in first and then the house goes in uh, so we don't get anything stuck. 
and we've got room for both. So as you can see, this is uh, <laughs> this is mighty tight, but we but it fit and it was preconceived as well, measuring the spaces to make sure that this was going to go back there without without any without any issues other than needing a highly skilled uh, driver. All right, so let's zoom forward here. So we're taking all the, the waterproofing off. All right, let's exit out, find some crane. Chris, yep. while you're looking for some pictures, we have a question. Is there an attic space and is it accessible? Um, so this house does not have an attic space that's usable. Uh, with you there, because of how much insulation we're blowing into the attic, there isn't really space left for attic. Uh, we would have to build a new floor system in there, in the attic, which is um, often it, it's pro probably better to, to add a shed than attic space to, to create that kind of storage. That said, the, you can do, can do a steeper roof pitch, which, which would create more headroom. Um, our square design path um, has wider houses. So this is 16, this is 16 feet wide. Uh, our design path, our square designs can go 24 feet wide, 18 feet wide. And those do have a much larger attic space. Uh, and the, with a Cape style roof, um, you can actually have a whole nother living area up there. You could build a master bedroom suite. So this is set in, set in the bigger of the two boxes. And uh, when we're doing this, uh, the crew is, is basically looking for precision within a quarter inch on the foundation. And, and often we're trying to get within an eighth of an inch to make sure that it's a nice tight fight on that tight fit on the foundation and that the siding when we put it on is going to have a nice um, clean face on it. It's a good shot of the of the bedroom bedroom coming in. And when we put these together, we're sealing um, we're sealing the the rim around here, so we're not getting any air infiltration. One of the one of the issues that in the past has given modular a bad name is the people setting it don't do a good job air sealing and these marriage walls end up um, being very leaky and being drafty and, and really impact the, the energy efficiency of the house but, but you can solve that simply by putting a gasket on that seal um, and there it is there it is all sided Ready to go, and one of the one of the neat things of note uh, when we were when we were working on this house, um, one of the things that defines our design paths is how big or small you can make the design path. And this house is on the edge of being as big as we'd want to make this from a length of the arms without making it look kind of awkward. Um, once this has the Goshen Stone patio up front. And the landscaping, it's going to tie it together, and it's going to look. It's going to be a really fantastic looking house. So I guess with that, that's that's. I think where we're ready to leave it. Are there any final questions before we wrap it up for the night? I'm not seeing any, but we'll give people a second to type if they are. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for spending part of your Thursday night with us. Um, again, I, I say this all the time, but I can't wait till we start doing some of these uh, in person again. They're so much more fun. And as somebody pointed out in the beginning of this call, um, uh, Alexis and I were talking and doing pregame uh, when we should be talking to people who showed up for the open house. But fortunately, we can't do that in this setting. Um, and no one knows what I'm talking about except for Linda. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for coming. 
Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send us an email. You can get me at chris.lee at backyardadus, or easier to remember, you can just do info at backyardadus. Alexis is alexis.ballas at backyardadus. Um, we will be sharing this recording uh, to everyone that attended uh, tomorrow or by early next week. And we'll also be sending you the link to the Matterport so you can tour this on your own and do your own measurements and see if your table will fit in there. Uh, and again, this was, we, we toured something that we built in our L-Line design path, um, which act as a starting point um, for building a backyard home or uh, doing this on a standalone lot. So thank you everyone, have a great night and I'm hope to see you all again soon.